Uh, I'm going to be presenting Cashew ML Input Data Processing as a service. Uh, this is an open source project that we have done at ETH Zurich, partly in collaboration uh, with Google. Now, before I actually start beginning talking, to talk about Cashew, I want to take a step back and look a bit at what data preprocessing in ML workloads traditionally looks like. Uh, your data is generally stored in, a, in local disk or in object storage, and then your input pipeline comes in and applies an ETL-like process on it uh, that runs on the CPU. This is an iterative process that produces batches, which are then ultimately uh, given to your model, which trains on an accelerator such as a GPU or a TPU. Now, our work focuses on the input pipeline. And what this looks like, well, this can vary a lot. Uh, a toil example here is you have some uh, binary data that you deserialize, you obtain some images, apply random transformations, and then obtain batches through this. Now, as you can see, uh, this is a monolithic design. Both the input pipeline and the model run on the same machine. And this is problematic uh, because you cannot scale the two components independently. Uh, because models train on very fast accelerators, whilst input pipeline usually run on quite slow CPUs, oftentimes your input pipeline will be slower than the model, and you cannot really do much uh, about that. So this brings us to some input preprocessing challenges. Waiting for batches costs time and money. You waste a lot of time by leasing expensive accelerators that you're not really using, and you're losing a lot of time, which you could have dedicated to another job. To show you how important the input pipeline resources are for ML workloads, uh, I have a few, a few curves here that show you how the epoch time progresses as you change the number of CPU cores per GPU and TPU accelerators for a few models. Uh, and we can see that the green and the blue curves, these are the RetinaNet and ResNet curves, show how much the epoch time changes as you change the resources. Now, assuming you fix this problem, preprocessing is still very expensive. A uh, study from Google shows that and, and quite redundant, actually. So a study from Google shows that around 10% of the unique input pipelines um, actually account for about 75% of the computation that they dedicate to preprocessing. Uh, another similar study from Meta shows that uh, sometimes preprocessing can take up more power than training itself in their data centers. But good news is that there are some opportunities that we can uh, tackle here. So, we can scale out the input pipeline and thus eliminate uh, these uh, bottlenecks. And then we can also utilize caching to avoid this redundant computation and reduce power consumption and free up these computational resources such that they can be used for other jobs. Now, the current landscape in ML preprocessing doesn't really lack solutions for disaggregating that you know, would allow us to scale the input pipeline out. A good example is TF Data Servers from Google. Uh, or the data preprocessing service for Meta, which is closed source, unfortunately. So the fundamental mechanism is already there. Um, what's really lacking is uh, something that can help us do this more automatically. So currently, what you could do is you could you know, trivially allo allocate a lot of resources for your uh, input pipeline, but that's very costly and not everyone has that luxury. Alternatively, if you're a practitioner, you can you know, uh, try out a lot of combinations for your uh, input pipeline in terms of resource allocation, but this is frustrating. This is very time consuming. It's very costly. Uh, again, if something changes in your input pipeline or your model, you have to redo this entire process. Uh, not to mention that if something changes during your runtime, uh, you, you really cannot react to that. So you're kind of uh, chained to whatever decision you made beforehand. Uh, in terms of caching, the fundamental functionality already exists in these frameworks. So implementing caching isn't really a, a research problem. What is, however, very difficult is to understand when and where does caching work in the input pipeline. Caching doesn't always make sense. Reading from cache might be slower, actually, than uh, recomputing. And assuming it does make sense, well, where does, does it make sense to you know, apply it in the input pipeline? Uh, perhaps there's several good options, but again, as a practitioner, you'd have to empirically try a bunch of, uh, a bunch of combinations and again, lose time, money, frustrating. Uh, and as soon as something changes in your model uh, or your input pipeline, you have to redo this entire process. So if you want to improve uh, ML workloads uh, by optimizing the pre-processing, uh, via these two methods, we definitely need to automate them. Doing them, practically, doing them manually is not practical. And this is where our main contributions come into play. We're answering how many resources should be assigned to preprocessing via our auto-scaling policy. 
And we're answering the question of when and where should data be cached in the input pipeline via the auto caching policy. And this is the system architecture for caching. And before I start to describe it, I want to point out that we build on top of TF Data Service. The reason behind this is that this aggregation is already available. This is an open source project. It's very popular. Uh, it's designed for large scale distributed ML workloads, and it has high impact to both uh, research and production environments. Because we build on top of this, we inherit some of its main components, uh, the dispatcher, which is essentially the brain of the operation, and then we have the workers, which are uh, the stateless entities that fetch data, pre-process it, produce batches, and then they give it to the client. In Cashew, we augment the logic of these components, and we also add the caching layer that is represented here by GlusterFS. We choose Gluster because uh, it scales very well. It gives us the throughput that we need for a caching layer. So how does the client and the service interact in Cashew? Um, before I actually start with that, I want to point out that we represent our clients here as having one accelerator, but actually you can have multiple accelerators, you can actually have multiple clients that are tied to the same job, so it can be as distributed as you really want. All right, so the client comes in and requests that its input pipeline is pre-processed. The dispatcher recruits a worker to do so. The worker starts reading uh, the data either from cache or from the source layer, depending on uh, the situation, and then it starts to give these batches to the client. On this example, we assume that uh, the client actually requires another worker such that the service can keep up with, it in, with, it, with its ingestion rate, and the dispatcher does just that, and it adds another worker. And because this is a long-running service, new clients come in, old clients leave, uh, but they can benefit from each other's uh, caching and also benefit from the auto-scaling policy. So the main features of Cashew are multi-tenancy, the disaggregation that we inherit from TF Data Service, the auto-scaling policy, and the auto-caching policy, uh, which allows you to not only decide if caching makes sense and where does it make sense, but also you can use it cross-job as well. How do you use this in code? Uh, and you're, if you're familiar with TF Data or even Spark, then you'll be right at home here. In fact, we don't really augment the API too much. And in this example, it's mostly TF Data uh, code. Um, I won't go into deep details, but we initially start off by just reading some data. This produces a data set object. On top of this object, we actually define the logic of the input pipeline, consisting of a set of transformations and some auto cache ops. I'll get into these in just a bit. Uh, then we request that the simple pipeline gets processed in the service by the distribute operation here, rather than doing it locally. And then in a very Pythonic manner, one iterates over this data set and obtains batches that they give to the uh, model. And I said I would, mention, I would mention something about these auto cache ops. These are operations that we have uh, added to the TF Data API. Um, the practitioner can place zero, one or more such operations uh, in the input pipeline. These are simply hints for the cashew runtime. Cashew will take a look at each of these uh, auto cache op locations and will infer the throughput of the pipeline if you were to introduce caching at only that location. Uh, cashew then collects all these throughputs and also the throughput of just purely recomputing everything and then chooses the option that is fastest. Uh, so the option with the highest throughput. The reason why we rely on hints here um, is because it's not quite clear where you can automatically uh, decide in the input pipeline where to put uh, caching. So uh, oftentimes input pipelines have random transformations that are there to make the models more robust. Uh, caching those um, might affect the model. Some practitioners might feel more comfortable with this than others, uh, but it's really a moving target. Uh, there are, however, very good strategies for avoiding you know, very detrimental effects on the model, and I'm happy to talk about them in the Q&A or offline. Uh, but yes, we rely on the user hints to kind of indicate good points of caching, and we just choose the one with the best throughput. Now, because we build on top of TF Data, we inherit the graph representation that comes with it. So in this particular uh, example, you'd obtain a graph like this. The nodes are the transformations, and the edges are the flow of data between these transformations. This graph representation allows us to conveniently gather metrics at every single node, uh, and we use these metrics for our auto-scaling and auto-caching decisions. And it also allows us to freely modify the computation that the workers do by just changing the structure of the graph. So for instance, we could just scan the graph for uh, the auto-cache ops, find the one that we are interested in, replace it with a cache get, for instance. All right, 
let's take a look at the auto caching policy. And as I mentioned before, what Cache does in a nutshell, it kind of goes through each of these auto cache ops that the practitioner places in the input pipeline and it infers the throughput uh, of the input pipeline if caching were introduced at that particular location. To exemplify this a bit, I've introduced here a pretty simple model, uh, sorry, a pretty simple input pipeline consisting of a read data operation, a set of transformations that follow, uh, the auto cache op in question, another set of transformations, and finally the last operation in the input pipeline. The first thing the cache does, it infers the times to actually read the data from cache rather than recomputing it until the auto cache opt. Uh, this is called the projected cache read time. Cache will then just compute the post auto cache time. This is the time it takes to apply the rest of the transformations on the read data from cache. These two values are added together to produce the projected total cache time. And such a projected total cache time is obtained for every single auto cache op in the input pipeline. We take these times together with the total compute time. This is the time if no caching were used whatsoever. And then we choose the option with the highest throughput. In other words, the option that yields the minimum time. All right, now let's take a look at the auto scaling policy. And to understand this better, we need to understand how the batch processing actually looks like. So processing a batch has two stages. Um, you first need to fetch the batch, and in cache you do so by fetching it from your local buffer. Every client has a buffer that is populated uh, with batches by cache. When your model needs a batch, it first looks at this buffer. If it's populated, the wait time is roughly uh, non-existent, and otherwise you must wait. So if your model is faster than your input pipeline, then you'll generally have to wait quite, quite a bit. The second part of this uh, batch processing is the model training itself. This consists of the forward and backward pass that you would do on the batch. Uh, and because um, we keep the number of accelerators constant during the training process and you know, the, the batch sizes are fixed uh, in these workloads, this time remains uh, constant. Together, these two components form the batch processing time. And during runtime, you can only see it as a monolith. You cannot really see the two elements. The intuition here is that while you cannot really change the model training time, you can change the fetch time. And by adding resources to your input pipeline, you will reduce the fetching time up until the point where it doesn't exist anymore, really. Um, and then you only have the model training itself. And so that's kind of the idea. We just keep adding resources and we stop when we see that this time doesn't improve anymore. To better exemplify, exemplify it, I've introduced here a simple example. Imagine that this is our initial uh, batch processing time. We add a worker. We see that it reduces the batch processing time. We keep doing it. And we keep doing it again. Now we've reached a point where Cashew notices that the batch processing time doesn't improve by adding this last worker. And because it's really superfluous, it doesn't do anything for performance, it only uh, costs us money, we remove it. And then we converge to this scale where uh, the fetching time is essentially non existent. All right, let's take a look at some uh, evaluation for the auto scaling policy. So for this, we choose a deep learning image classification workload, uh, consisting of the ResNet input pipeline that runs on N2 standard AGCE instances, the ResNet 50 model that trains on four NVIDIA V100 GPUs, and then the ImageNet data set that resides originally in GCS, uh, it's approximately 140 gigabytes in size. The input pipeline is fairly standard for image classification. We do some simple augmentations. We add a, an auto cache op hint right after reading the data and right at the end of the input pipeline. And we name these two modes, source caching and full caching, respectively. What we want to see here is how our auto scale policy compares with the Kubernetes horizontal pod auto scaler, uh, which uses uh, hardware signals such as CPU utilization and memory utilization to indicate uh, whether we should scale up or down. Now, here on the y-axis, we have the epoch time in seconds. And then on the x-axis, we have the number of workers. Um, we have three different curves, uh, each representing the epoch time and how it changes based on the number of workers that your uh, service has um, in all of these three different execution modes, compute, source cache, and full cache. Uh, and we also have a horizontal line uh, that shows us the model bottleneck. This is the point where no matter how many resources you add to your input pipeline, 
uh, your model is the bottleneck at that point and you can't really move forward. What we want to see is that Cashew, which is the orange annotations, chooses the uh, intersection point between the curves and this horizontal line. This is where you're not over-provisioning but not under-provisioning either. And this is exactly what it does in the compute case and in the uh, other two caching um, scenarios that we chose to study here. Uh, Kubernetes, on the other hand, doesn't fare so well. Uh, in compute mode, uh, it converges to one worker. Now, the reason behind this is that you're reading your data from GCS. And uh, the throughput of a bucket is scaled up based on the number of readers that a bucket has. Since you only have one worker, the throughput is quite low. Uh, this doesn't keep the worker busy. The, G the CPU utilization is too low to trigger a scale up. And this tricks Kubernetes into thinking that, well, this is the right scale. Now, there's two other interesting cases here as well. Uh, but due to time constraints, I won't go into them, but full details in the, in the paper. Now let's take a look at how the auto-scaling and auto-caching policies kind of work together in multiple tenant environments. In this case, we have two jobs, each with four epochs. Um, they both use the ResNet input pipeline together with the toy model. Both jobs are virtually identical with the single difference that the second job has twice the ingestion rate requirements of the first, meaning that it requires twice the number of workers as job one. What we want to really see is how the auto-caching and auto-scaling policies work in this scenario. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> here on the y-axis we have the worker count and on the x-axis we have the uh, elapsed time. The red curve shows the worker progression of job one throughout this experiment and we'll see a blue curve later on that's uh, the worker count progression for uh, job two. Now because this is a fresh run um, of the system, there's no data cache, so job one, uh, comes up and then goes straight into compute. Um, and then scaling starts to happen. It converges eventually at three workers. Cache also this time decides to put the data into cache because it feels that it would be actually, it would save resources later on. Uh, so in the second epoch, the data is placed into cache. Scaling is reset because it's a different execution mode. But in this mode as well, it scales to three workers. Finally, we move on to the last two epochs of the first job. And let's focus here on the red curve. This time we're reading from cache and we're converging to uh, two workers. Uh, so this is good. This means that putting the data in cache made sense. We actually saved one worker and uh, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're also saving a bit on time as well. Uh, and now if we move to the second job, we're seeing that this, because it's identical to the first, bar the ingestion rate requirements, it, Cache it notices the cache hit and it reads the data directly from cache rather than recomputing it. This ultimately scales to four workers, which is good because it's twice the ingestion rate of the first one. So um, the policies seem to work well together. All right, so to wrap up, we believe that data preprocessing is an essential part of ML workloads. Um, it is often a source of bottlenecks that cause expensive accelerator stalls and a lot of wasted time as well. And to this extent, we propose Cache, which is an input pipeline as a service system, uh, bringing in to the table auto caching and auto scaling policies, multi tenancy support as well. It's open source, and we believe that this is a rich platform for future research uh, in this area. All right. Thank you very much. And that was it for me. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.